Hello, I'm Fergus Early. Um, my involvement with Chisholm Hill was from the very start in the sense that I was part of the original X6 collective who had reached the end of their tenancy in um, Butler's Wharf. And the initial desire was continuity, was you know, how can we go on from here? But it coincided with the desire of a lot of artists of different sorts who had had studio space in Butler's Wharf, also looking for a space. And the, the people who were quickest off the market, in, in this case, were the group of mainly uh, visual artists, painters, sculptors. Um, they located the building, I think, and we came in with it, with the idea that there was a suitable place that could be converted into a dance space. And as I say, it was a way of continuity. Most of us wanted to carry on some of the work and some of the ways of working that we developed over the what, four, four odd years at, at um, Butler's Wharf. Mm -hmm. And um, we also wanted to expand on that, on the ways of working and, and develop them. Probably most of all, in the way that we wanted to be certainly more, uh, more a little bit more outward facing in sense of kind of relating to a community, which had never been really very possible to relate to a local community, a geographical community in, in X6. Because literally local people wouldn't just wouldn't walk down La Phone Street or Shad Thames. It was sort of there's a kind of legacy of Jack the Ripper still hung in the air. And people, you know, it was it was never we tried once or twice to do children's classes and things like that. And they never took off because local people wouldn't wouldn't come. And anyway, they probably wouldn't didn't want to walk up six flights of wooden stairs <laughs> to a totally unsafe building. <laughs> it wasn't surprising really. But there was with, with Chisholm Hale, it was in the middle of a residential area, virtually opposite a primary school. And um, the idea was that we would a expand the collective, invite other people in, and also look at ways of working in and with the community as well as the working with ourselves and each other as, as artists or as development of, of new ways of teaching and learning and so on. So I was, I was part of that initial group and um, my earliest memories are sort of a freezing cold winter's day prizing ceramic tiles off the walls uh, in places there, which actually a lot of which a lot of the work we did eventually became the gallery the, the, rather than the dance space. We, we all did a lot of work together, and that meant, as I say, rising tiles off the downstairs space where, where they used to steam the um, furniture when it was a veneer factory. That was, that was the sort of initial labour, sheer labour. Over one winter in particular, which is pretty horrible. I mean, that makes sense that everyone was kind of working across um, the building, um, but I didn't realise that that was, that work was going on in, in what became that gallery space. Yes, I mean, so it started off with quite a good, as you said, kind of cross cross arts collaboration and so on. It didn't last all the way that way because there's certain times when the interest of the dance space and the interest of the artist didn't quite coincide, but it did mean that the long and abortive idea of making a theatre in the building, which I still think would have been a very clever and right move. Um, I think there was a space there, to my knowledge, it probably still isn't being used, which is madness, you know, 40 years of dereliction. And it could have been a magnificent canal side venue. That's another story at the moment, I guess. Um, so I was initially one of the dance artists at the dance space and fairly early on, by about 83, I decided to make a work for children, for audiences of children. And with Patricia Bailey and Jim Vojak, we made Ubu, the kind of rendering of the play. Patricia's big thing was vocal dance and the relationship in the voice and, 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 and we used Voices very, we, we, we used to kind of Im improvise nonsense language throughout and uh, improvise music, Jim particularly, a fairly anarchic piece, which we called, as a company, we called it Green Candle then, but it wasn't 
Dream Time hadn't been set up as a sort of charity and a company and all that at that point. It was just a name we took because because Uber carries around a green candle. But that was the first production. And it toured quite extensively around schools and special schools in, uh, around England. Two tours, I think, actually. Um, you're saying that you, that was a piece that you developed specifically for a sort of children, younger audience. How was it received? Because I, I imagine that, I mean, it must have been something quite new for children to see stuff like that. Generally speaking, they loved it. The, yeah. the problem is sometimes with the teachers... I mean, I remember visiting a special school somewhere, like maybe in Newcastle or something like that, and some of the teachers were totally appalled because they said, well, you know, we, we spend all the time with the children with speech therapists and so on, trying to you know, help them to speak properly, and uh, there you're coming and doing all this gobbledygook. And, and in fact, the point is that the children understood every single noise you made. They understood completely. I mean, it's not, not, all, not all teachers, but there were one, you know, one or two places where we got a pretty hostile reception on that. But actually the children loved it. They had a ball. I mean, they liked the anarchy of it and got it, just got it totally. (laughs) Apart from Uber, the best show that we did when the company was kind of properly constituted uh, was Una and Finn, again for uh, children, primary school children audiences. Again with music by Jim Borjak and performing uh, Nigel Warwick, Janice Galloway, myself. Yeah, I think that was it. Um, that, that again toured extensively. Well, we did our first work for older audiences. Uh, for me, it's quite important because that's become so central to all the work over the years. And that was called Your Prayer is Doubled When You Sing. It was so parallel biographies, two women who we met in a keep fit class in Hackney. One of them was a Jamaican woman who'd come to this country and worked as a midwife and ended up writing a book about her experiences. And the other was a Polish woman who ended up in England at the end of the Second World War after extraordinary sort of, she was in Russian labour camps and in Palestine and just extraordinary stories. Anyway... We, we used their own sort of photographs and family pictures and recordings of their voices as a kind of soundtrack and a visual uh, skeleton. We took that to a mixture of theatres. Only at one point we put it on at the, um, the Rio Cinema in Hackney. Mm. What was lovely was that two women attracted their own audiences and, and the, the part of the audience that was sort of Polish or the part that was Jamaican... <laughs> It's all the entire show is entirely about them. They didn't notice that there was anything else. But the other ones did. So they were, they were like two separate shows. What we did was to use the sort of back projection, which was a device that we developed for, um, which Jackie and I developed for IHSL. So I used it again with this idea of a sort of biographies with these big photographs projected. And rethinking approaches to teaching, rethinking approaches to who can be a dancer and dancing, all this stuff was was going around in new dance and being questioned. And you were part of um, Peter Brinson's Ballet for All. What was it about that crossover with the community and different communities that interested you at that time and sort of making work, for example, for children? I think perhaps very specifically that 1982 I became a father and so I had a young child at this point, two or three year old, and um, with a group of people, a collective, we started a nursery for our children. And uh, So all the, all the issues around, around children and childcare and all the rest of it were very present for me. And that's what I think. I, I think that's what specifically made me want to be part of that. I think there are some other sort of perhaps more broader things even. That, I mean, from, from the start, I mean, Ballet for All was like 20 years earlier than that, you know, when it started and I started with it. At that point, I was also just a dancer, a ballet dancer, and doing what ballet dancers do, and always conscious of the a sort of distance and maybe a to a certain extent, disconnection, a certain, certain distance between the performers and the audience, or the, there's, meant, there's kind of meant to be a distance. There's meant to be this distance of extraordinary virtuosity and things, you know, in that in, in ballet and, and that kind of work. 
Um, well, I didn't didn't dislike being in, in a ballet company at the time. I mean, I mean, there was lots to learn and, and, and so on. But I think I was always conscious that there wasn't that we, you know, we, it's a matter of communication. We, we, you know, there, there, they, they could and there should be much greater form of communication and so on. So for me, Valley for All was again an attempt to, to, to do that. It was a chance to sort of speak directly to people. You know, this was actually the start of all of that was long before the concept of sort of performing and doing workshops with you know members of the audience and all that stuff that you know became the just the usual happening of, of dance companies and so on anyway so there was that later on there was the there was all the work we did at x6 which wasn't community work in that sense but it was developing tools that were terribly useful in that in that situation you know Anything from contact improvisation to whatever release technique, all these all these things were tools that widened the range of how you could contact people through dance and and uh, and, and also get people to learn things about dance and so on. So that was very important. So when I came to the the, the point when I wanted to really develop the idea that everybody's got the right to dance, and uh, but how do you actually set about finding out everybody and making it a reality um, if not everybody you know at least the people who had usually have the least access pretty much where we went with green candle over the years looking at the places where there was most need hopefully that was the idea so at that time in the in the sort of early mid 80s how were you using chisholm Hell? green candle as a you know, properly yeah, properly constituted company and so on that was 87, but was working on it before that. Its first three years or, so, or two, four years even were just now. We had the office, we shared a bit of the office, that tiny office, we had a corner. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was, you know, when we first, our first administrator was while we were there. Um, I mean, there were various other things I, w- I would be doing I mean, I remember occasionally running some children's classes at Chisholm Hale. There were things that we put it together as a collective, like big conference. That, um, yeah, I can't remember the actual date. But... The 1986 New Dance Conference, in which you oh. um, gave your paper, the, the Liberation Notes paper. Yeah. 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 That's right. So there was stuff like that. It was, you know, it was featuring quite heavily in different ways. And, um doing workshops as we were still inviting people in, you know, in the same way that we had at at X6. That that sort of thing was still going on. And um, and New Dance magazine at that time was still being run out of Chisholm Hell. Is that right? Yes, until Ramsey took over editing, maybe about that time, about 86. Yeah, yeah. There was so much happening during that period. The amount of performances happening each month, the amount of workshops, it was really ambitious and also it, it just demonstrates the need for it as well that people needed space to show this work and that was Chisholm Hill was one of the only spaces that it could be shown yeah yeah that's yeah. right quite interesting that through the 70s this momentum was building there were lots of collectives and then in the 80s with Thatcher and the squeeze on on public funds anyway um it changed the landscape again, and, and these these sort of more alternative spaces were under threat. Yeah, but, but the idea was then, basically, no, we're not going to support artists. We're not going to support original art. We're going to support community work, um, which is sort of, sort of safer. Now, of course, I want community work to be supported in all sorts of ways. And in some ways, that was very successful policy in that we kind of are seen to lead the world in the community dance area and all the rest of it. But in other ways, I think it was a cowardly decision that that somehow, you know, you you couldn't actually support real live artists making real life new work in particular places. So my last question then, how how would you describe what Chisholm How was at that time? Well, I think the number one thing which characterizes it right from the start and even just now, I think maybe, or we're still holding on to that, just the thing that it was genuinely artist-led, genuinely trying to make new things work. At times, pretty, you know, 
Gen genuinely, from time to time, collective. I don't know if that still applies in quite the same way, but I think those early days, it was a real attempt to, to keep a, a, a collectivity about it and to be inclusive. It, it looks, in a way, it looks better now than it did at the time, I'd say. Um, I suppose at the time we were all just conscious of the, all our individual struggles and so on very much. But it's quite impressive what he was still doing, even through, you know, into the, into the Thatcher era man, and managing to survive. It's fairly extraordinary. It is. I mean, it's a, it's a huge um, building, but the, the dance space itself is big. Just the fact that, that you, you went into that space and completely renovated it, then established a programme and got people in and, and got funding and, you know, you know, organised everything and the admin side of stuff. It's, it's such an incredible task um, for something completely artist led and self led, you know, from that from that collective. Just also trying to do your own work um it's extraordinary yeah 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 it is i, I think it is yeah. that in itself comes back to this whole idea of community in this in its broadest sense um just like x6 it was a space that was being created because it was needed you know there was nowhere else for this experimental alternative work but it was a, it wasn't just a space for yourselves it was a space for the dance community the local community any you know it was a space to be shared um, yeah. and, and carving out a sort of ideological space as well in doing so, you know, for this work yeah. and this, yeah. this type of work. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you for talking to me.